Walgreens partnered with the federal government, the White House, HHS, and CMS to set up drive-through testing. That involves actually first responders, healthcare workers, and then those that are at risk who may be positive for coronavirus. The Walgreens team has done a great job working very quickly, pulling on all the resources that they have, and we've been able to set this up in literally a week's time. We asked our volunteers, we said, who wants to help really support the community and be at the forefront of the profession? I don't know of any pharmacist in the organization that has done the testing that we're planning on having you guys do. We're helping the community, but we're changing everyone's mind of what a pharmacist can do. If you get the tent here, you're going to have a plastic container with your initials, your initials, everyone's initials on it. Once you get home, though, it does need to breathe in order for it to be reusable. If you're a runner, you're going to get this kit. When we talked about kits, you are now looking at a kit. We had several kit. meetings. Some were web-based, some were at the actual corporate office doing presentation learnings. Then we had some practical with uh, physicians that came on site. PAs were there also, nurse practitioners, to evaluate our gear and how we did it. Went through the training of the donning and the doffing of the safety wear so we'd be protecting ourselves. Try not to touch your face shield. Throughout this training, we've been told our safety is paramount. You know, the team's been working countless hours to make sure that we execute this, um, plan everything out to the finest detail, and perform that high caliber. Take off my stuff, and then put on the new stuff, and then I go this way. So the first wave of patients is going to be police officers and firefighters. So this will be a nice pilot run with workers who understand this business and understand this industry. We know this is a success when that first patient comes in and gets tested, right? We don't know the results. Those patients will at least have the peace of mind that they don't have coronavirus or that they do. And they need to be quarantined and they need to take the time to get healthy when they can be on the road to recovery. Uh, happy to stand in here and help in communities all across America because a lot of times when we have natural disasters, our stores are a beacon in the community. To at least know that maybe a nebulizer treatment would, would help out. Uh, this is really groundbreaking work because this can kind of show what pharmacists can really do. It's never too late to get involved if you really want to make a difference or you feel like you want to do something different. As far as giving back to your patients, you're already doing that. You're, you're on the front lines talking to them, trying to keep them calm and just keep doing that. That's all. It makes a huge difference to the community. So just thank you for doing it. Welcome to our session today. My name is Renee Smith, and I am Head of Portfolio Management at Walgreens Boots Alliance, and it will be my pleasure to moderate the conversation today. I have a few purposes for our conversation. First, I'd like to introduce you to some amazing leaders at Walgreens Boots Alliance. I'd like to share with you a little bit about what we can really accomplish when we all put our minds and hearts together and uh, serve a common goal. I'd also like to highlight the wonderful place Walgreens Boots Alliance is and um, to be able to contribute your talents there. So with that, I'll make a quick introduction of our panelists, uh, but I really want you to get to know them. So I'm going to give them also an opportunity to speak about themselves and share their journey. First, I have Brian Amond, who is supply ch uh, Senior Director, Supply Chain Systems at Walgreens. I have Amy Biesenthal, who's Senior Manager of Supply Chain Inventory Management. Susan, uh, Suzette <laughs> Jeskowiak, uh, who is Vice President of Pharmacy, Healthcare, and Customer Engagement Technology. I know Suzette very well. And Kristen Vargas, who's Vice President of Walgreens Retail Operations. So these are our panelists for today, and I'll give them each an opportunity as the first question to introduce themselves, share with us a little bit about their career journey, highlighting the types of things that have prepared them to do things like bat battle a global pandemic. So let's start with you, Brian. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm Brian Eamon. Uh, super excited to be here today. Um, a little about myself. I've been in the industry about um, 20 plus years, started uh, in, in consulting for 10 years, worked for Ernst & Young, worked for Capgemini, really helping uh, retail customers uh, implement technology to, to solve their business problems. Then I came to Walgreens. I've been at Walgreens for 15 years. Um, 
I, I'm responsible for all of the supply chain systems, so end-to-end, uh, -end, so all of your forecasting, ordering, all of the warehouse management systems, transportation, and then the vendor collaboration and, and analytics. And as far as what some of my experience has been that in the past to help with a global pandemic, I'll say it to start, I've never seen anything quite like this, right? Um, just the, the, the scale of it being truly global and just the speed which it has moved. But some of the experience I've had to, that I have drawn upon on this, um, have, have experience implementing large new capabilities for our company and our customers. So implementing forecasting, ordering systems, standing up multiple new distribution centers, new transportation systems. So bringing those new capabilities is something that was needed as part of COVID. But what's different is typically those are six months, year long project for COVID. It had to be done in days, weeks at most, right? And that's where the other aspect that some of my experience of dealing with the operational side from a supply chain side, more like you'd see in the in natural disasters with uh, tornadoes, hurricanes, where we've had to quickly come up with solutions very quick to help our customers and patients. So really drawing on those those two pieces, but definitely no no playbook from the, the from before <laughs> for dealing with something like this. But that that's a little about myself and some of my experience. Thank you. Amy. Hello everyone. My name is Amy Biesenthal. I'm currently responsible for inventory management for the grocery and household categories. I started with Walgreens as a supply chain intern and have moved around the supply chain a little bit, um, spending a lot of time in various analytic roles, um, a couple years in transportation, and I also spent a few years practicing corporate law, which is a little bit of a diversion from the supply chain career. Um, in particular, for, per, per, you know, preparing for the coronavirus, I think, you know, I echo what Brian said, there's nothing that can prepare you for that. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, being able to respond to that, the background in analytics uh, was hugely helpful for that. So it prepared me to dig into the mass amounts of data that we needed um, to be able to respond and make that data really digestible and actionable. Um, and then throughout my career, I've spent a lot of time working on continuous improvement initiatives, um, which also was really beneficial to help me quickly develop new processes um, to respond to the changing environment and um, ensure better product availability. Awesome, thank you. Suzette? Hi, I'm Suzette Jaskowiak and I've been in technology my whole career with roles in both application development and infrastructure. I've also split my time between consulting and industry roles. I've been at Walgreens for a little over eight years now in my current role, I'm responsible for all of the pharmacy, healthcare, call center technologies, as well as the store technology and field services organization that supports uh, all the different technology and hardware and software in the stores. So I would echo uh, some of my other peers in really natural disasters have been a good learning ground, I think, uh, with Walgreens always stepping out in front to support the community in natural disasters and having to move quickly with very little resources uh, in a natural disaster situation. I would also say that moving into this digital era has set a good framework for handling the pandemic. We have some great base capabilities that had been implemented and allowed us to, as Brian said, very quickly bring other solutions to our customers and patients. So I think that's also been very helpful. Great, thank you. And Kristen. Hi everyone, I'm Kristen Vargas. It's great to be here today. Um, from my perspective, um, I think one of the things that I have, um, well, so first of all, I've been with Walgreens 24 years. Uh, I started in the stores uh, as a cashier and have worked my way around the company. Uh, this is my um, ninth relocation. So I recently moved back to Illinois to work in the support office. I've relocated nine times and have lived in seven states. This is my second time actually in Illinois. Uh, so I've had a, a wide variety of experience, uh, again, working in the store, supporting customers, really understanding what they need and supporting our team members. My current job at Walgreens is uh, I support the stores in translating all of the things that Suzette and Brian and our merchant partners and our marketing partners, making sure that the stores really understand why we're doing the things that we're doing, helping them make their jobs easier 
and, and making sure that it really comes to life in the stores. I will echo everything everyone said, nothing quite prepares you for a global pandemic uh, when it comes to being prepared for um, how to handle these things. I would agree that natural disasters are probably the best setup, uh, but I think for me, the, the point that I learned from all of the natural disasters from the other end of working at the support office is the importance of communicating to your team and making sure that they are comforted and feel safe and they understand really what's going on. And then the importance of reaching out and relying on partners like Suzette, Amy, and Brian, and, and all of those around you to get you the things that you need so that you can really focus on what's important, which is your team members and customers. Excellent. Uh, thank you all for those introductions. And Kristen, let's stay with you for a moment. Um, that's quite a role you have there, a really important one. Speak for a moment about how Walgreens is keeping customers and employees safe. Sure. Um, so again, we've, we've learned a lot as we go and with the information always changing, but being an essential employer and having 200 80,000 team members out on the front lines every day, helping our team, helping our customers. It, safety was our first priority. And so we've evolved that as we go, taking the recommendations of the CDC, of course. And um, we knew we had to stay open so that customers could get the things that they needed, their prescriptions, their daily needs. We are, um, we are a staple for many Americans. Um, so we've implemented um, face coverings or surgical masks for all of our team members. We ask them to wear that unless if there's a health condition that prevents them to do so. Um, we've been doing that, I think, fairly regularly for um, the past, uh, I guess time slips by me, probably 12 weeks or so um, as we started the pandemic. We've also put up plastic plexiglass shields at all of the registers so that there still provides that sort of physical barrier between a customer and a team member and to make sure that people have the distance. And then of course, as you go into many retailers, all of the social distancing signs um, and trying to remind our customers that it's important that we stay a safe distance apart. It means sometimes that we can't help customers in the way that they're accustomed to, um, but we think that that's best for our, our team members. And of course, we've increased our cleaning protocols, asking our stores to clean more frequently, um, wash their hands more frequently, just continuing to remind team members of the importance of taking care of themselves as well as taking care of their customers. Uh, that's really, I think, the forefront of, of what we've been able to do. And, and again, we continue to change this guidance as the CDC recommends and really trying to stay close to that as well. That was one of the other really important things is our chief medical officer met with our district managers regularly at the start of the pandemic to be able to provide them guidance, make sure that they had the most recent information that they could also pass along to their teams. Brilliant. How about from Brit or the support office perspective? Brian, same question. Yeah, yeah, I can speak to that. So from a corporate office, there's some a, a slightly different issues or concerns that come up compared to the, the store uh, employees as well as customers, just because the, the density of how everyone's working close together in a corporate office and just uh, open seating the way our office are set up where people don't have, um, you know, uh, dedicated seats, right? So one of the things is Walgreens, like Kristen mentioned, is lucky enough to have a, a chief medical officer, a medical uh, staff. We're able to give the guidance of what policies and procedures need to be put in place to help ensure our employees are safe. But besides keeping our employees safe, it was also really important to ensure they felt comfortable returning to work, right? So the mental aspect of it, and that's a really important thing because people are nervous just in, in general with the unknown for this. We wanted to make sure it was really communicated of what we were doing to keep our employees safe so they felt comfortable returning to the office. So we did a few things. We started by HR sending out a survey, just getting a pulse. How did our employees feel about the idea of coming back to work? What were their concerns? Then a group was formed with the medical team that I spoke of. Uh, the HR facilities, all the business units, and came up with the plan of the policies and procedures. We did communication out for training of it to make sure it was understood that people knew we were, you know, making sure they were going to be safe returning to the office, and then had a, a journey, a, a video explaining kind of what the process is going to be like as they return. And a lot of the procedures we implemented are probably similar to what other companies, people are listening, are, have done. But, you know, you do a self-check when you first uh, wake up and want to come in. Make sure you don't have any symptoms. If you do, you're obviously asked not to come in the office and see a health provider. Um, 
if, if you are having no symptoms coming in the office, we're doing temperature checks coming in the office. And then when you're in the office, things are obviously different in the sense of we've, we've blocked off space so that we're social distancing in the office. So people aren't working within six feet of each other, uh, making sure traffic set up one ways common areas aren't open for the cafeteria, so we aren't congregating, and then really making sure people understand all of the extra cleaning protocols, uh, extra sanitation going on to keep them safe. One other thing I'll mention is we didn't stop just with, with our employees, because for IT, we work a lot with vending partners, right? So we're also very concerned with, you know, Cognizant TCS, some of our primary, primary vending partners, what they were doing to keep their employees safe and open in their offices in India, because if they're impacted, obviously it impacts us and impacts our customers and patients. So we really worked close with them, collaborated with them, shared best practices. Um, so overall, uh, just really proud of how, how Walgreens has handled of just making sure we we're keeping our employees safe and they felt comfortable. Very much what you would expect from a healthcare company like Walgreens. Safety first, absolutely. <laughs> so let's go to, how about Amy first? How did you go about transitioning your teams into these new ways of work, uh, keeping them productive and engaged? What can you share? Sure. Um, I'll start off by talking a little bit about the work that Walgreens has done over the last couple years. Um, you know, kind of as Brian alluded to a little bit, we have a different work environment um, that we've transitioned to over the last few years. Um, called uh, Workplace for Tomorrow. And so as part of that, um, Walgreens created a more flexible and collaborative work environment, um, which included the reconfiguration of the physical space at our corporate offices or support center, um, but also the introduction of new technology. Um, and so with the introduction of that technology, it set the stage for us to be able to um, work remotely more easily, um, creating a more digital environment. Um, I know my team uses Microsoft Teams a lot, so um, we use that for not only, you know, most of our meetings and chat on a, you know, minute by minute basis, um, but also, you know, for different features like file sharing. Um, we've learned a lot about Microsoft Teams over the last few months, um, so that's been a benefit, and we've been able to be really productive and engaged um, through those digital tools. Um, I'll also say that staying productive for my team in particular has been um, pretty easy because there's so much work to be done. Um, we, we've done a lot to support COVID on the inventory management side. So um, there's more work um, to do than can be done. So that's definitely enabled uh, productivity. And then as far as staying engaged, um, you know, we've utilized video um, to be able to connect to one another. We've set up some virtual happy hours. Um, we continue to plan team engagement events and activities. Um, and then um, another, you know, sort of tool, I guess I've used is, um, you know, providing routine and stability. So keeping some of the recurring meetings that, you know, the team is used to um, help to provide some sort of normalcy in a very unnormal time. So, um, you know, our weekly um, touch bases, team meetings, department meetings, I think all of that just helps them to, you know, to feel, you know, a sense of normalcy and stability. Um, and then lastly, I'll add that, you know, the teams really enjoyed the flexibility um, that comes with remote work. So, we're in Chicago and um, a lot of people commute, you know, two, three hours a day. Some people live in the city, some people live in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, so being able to stay at home has, you know, provided a little bit, um, you know, of a benefit. And, um, you know, it, there's always the bonus of being able to, you know, stay in pajamas all day. So <laughs> I love that. So Suzette, you lead a very large team. Um, what would you add to that? So I would say a lot of similar uh, ideas that Amy shared. I think what I could share is one thing that Walgreens did is the vice presidents meet weekly and really share how the company is doing and what we're doing to um, support our patients, our customers, and the organization, our team members. And so I've, uh, I thought, that went really well. And so I've been doing town halls with my team and sharing, you know, I think the communication piece of just sharing as much information as you can uh, has really been powerful. I think we've shared a lot of ways of working, things like the 
virtual happy hour. Um, I have some some folks or, um, in my organization that do games on Teams. Um, you, if you, any of you have kids, you might remember, you know, your kindergartner being the star of the week. We have some of that going on. Um, so I think the teams have come up with some really creative ways to stay engaged, even you know, outside without being uh, connected physically. I will say that some things came up that were a little bit surprising to me. So uh, I think people worry that there would be uh, less productivity. And what I have found uh, similar to Amy is that actually people are way more productive and to a point where people are feeling like they can never turn off work. So because I'm not driving in, everyone feels free to schedule a 7 a.m. meeting and they feel free to schedule a 6.30 p.m. meeting. And so you go into the office, you know, at 6.30 a.m. and you're like there at eight o'clock at night and you never came out, right? So I think being aware and making sure people know that, <clears throat> hey, you don't have to accept that 7 a.m. meeting, right? Like be cognizant of your team members and help your team members out. And then I would say the other thing is just being really aware of folks that had other responsibilities besides work, you know, having children at home, having um, elderly parents at home, you know, someone that you have to care for because they are no longer wherever they would normally be during the day. And so really making sure that we support those team members has been important. Those are all really great points. I'd like to encourage uh, the participants to share in the chat what you've been doing. You know, what fun things have you been doing with your teams and how have you stayed engaged and, and give us some tips as well. Feel free also to add any questions uh, to the chat and we'll monitor for those. Sure. think maybe we lost Renee. Yes, you know, uh, while Renee, I think maybe we, um, we can continue the conversation. So I've been, uh, I think I'll be uh, happy to kind of take the lead from further where she had. So I think one of the challenge we, I mean, there are always a cases where um, during this pandemic, you all always found um, something which is you felt very proud of or maybe more shocking or more something intru intriguing um, from your experience you know something that you can share from either you know brian or amy especially <laughs> you also have supply chain and and distribution sites and you know a lot of customer facing as well so you know anything anything that you can share with the audience here yeah i could i could take that from from a shocking i will say I never saw coming um, the the run on toilet paper that we saw in our stores. Definitely was shocked. Never saw that coming. Still don't understand it. Still laughing about it. But I will also say, though I was laughing about it for a week, I was also in the store after a week buying it because I didn't want to be that last person knocking on my neighbor's door asking for a square to spare, right? So that was shocking. The other is just this, the speed at which it, it moved, right? You know, I heard about it somewhere the other side of the world happening. Uh, I thought it was going to be like SARS, slow moving. Next thing I heard, it's, you know, in Italy, heard of a few cases in the U.S. and it felt like another couple of days. And all of a sudden in Illinois, we were in a, um, in a state home order, like much of the country, right? And it's just shocking how fast that moved. And that's where it also turned into one of the proudest things I would say is the way we, we dealt with it, because it really changed the way our customers and patients relied on us. They weren't able to go to the store to get what they needed. So they were having to to, to order it online with us in our e-com capacity. And I'm talking items that were necessary for COVID here, right? So mm -hmm. you're talking the cleaning supplies, hand sanitizer, aspirin, thermometer, all of those things, they couldn't go to the store. We had to have a way to, you know, they were looking for us to deliver it to home. And from a capacity standpoint, we were seeing capacity from our e-com facilities that were larger than our peaks that we'd ever seen, larger than Christmas, and every day it was like that. Mm -hmm. So we quickly had to stand up a team to say, what could we do to increase the capacity? Great example of teamwork from collaboration. We had IT, we had uh, DC operations, we had Amy's team from the supply chain planning, all got together virtually because we couldn't meet with COVID, right? And really just the brainstorming, the innovation, the ideas people came up with to do this quickly. Normally something like this would take six months to a year, 
had to be done in days and weeks, right? And using just knowing it had to be some manual ways to do it quick, as well as still technology to make it efficient. So I'm uh, very proud, able to stand up a, a first distribution center in a week, going chain wide within two weeks. And within a month, we had three additional facilities to really help make sure we were still fulfilling our customer and patient needs. So just super proud of what was accomplished from the team with that. Absolutely. And Amy, I think you had very similar thing on the storefront where the household and products were more coming out of the uh, yeah. inventory management. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's similar to what Brian said, you know, we spend six months preparing for Christmas um, volumes and this was Christmas, 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 <laughs> Christmas. So, um, you know, we, it, it was incredible volumes that we saw that we had to respond to. And um, in terms of the most shocking and intriguing, I have to also echo Brian's sentiment around the, you know, the bath issue. Um, bath, I, I manage the paper cleaners and grocery categories. And, you know, we saw volume spikes across all of those, but I was most um, intrigued with the paper sales, um, as were the suppliers. So, um, you know, when the shelter in place orders, you know, first went into place, we saw a lot of pantry loading for essentials and that consume that consumer behavior seemed to make sense. Um, you know, we weren't sure how long we were going to be sheltered in place um, or what was going to happen with the virus. Um, you know, we knew that there were um, flight restrictions that were being enacted and um, just a lot of uncertainty and unknown. So, um, you know, it, it made sense that consumers, um, you know, ran out to stock up on, you know, essentials. Um, not, you know, the, the paper sales were above and beyond that. Um, it, it was the initial spike, but then also the continued um, need for those. Um, so we spent a lot of time, um, you know, over the last few months trying to understand that, trying to move the paper physically through our supply chain, um, and then working really closely with our suppliers to try to restore product availability, um, which is just now, um, you know, starting to happen. Um, we're also trying to understand that purchasing behavior so that we can, um, you know, prepare the supply chain for a possibility of, you know, a second wave. Um, we learned a lot about, you know, the paper business, the industry, um, the supply chain more than I ever thought I would know about how, you know, that manufacturing works. Um, you know, thinking through the different um, businesses on the commercial paper side versus the retail paper side, you know, as people um, were shelter in place, they started consumption actually increased at home. And so whereas initially we thought the increase in sales was, you know, sort of people hoarding and panic buying, you saw a lot of that, you know, those terms and a lot of, you know, memes and um, jokes on Facebook and social media about, um, you know, the, the excess of toilet paper, what we sort of shifted to an understanding of was that it was really an increase in consumption as well. So with people being home, they're not using, you know, the, the bath tissue out at the office or at stores or restaurants. Um, and so that was a really interesting learning um, dynamic and um, definitely intriguing. So, um, and then just in terms of, um, you know, what I was most proud of for, you know, what the company has has done is just the ability to quickly respond. I know um, Brian mentioned this and Kristen too, um, things that would have typically taken the company, you know, months or even years um, to do, we did in a matter of weeks. Um, and so that was, it was really cool to see the, you know, the company be able to react that way. Yeah. So Renee is back, so I'm gonna give the rain back to her. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I have an, a new question for the audience now. What's been your biggest faux pas <laughs> during COVID-19 <laughs> communications? <laughs> Mine just right now, I was literally asking a question and I heard Suzette say, I think we've lost her name. <laughs> and I'm going, but I'm right here. <laughs> I, I also had a Zoom. I'd love to hear from the audience. What else, what else has happened? I, I also had a Zoom incident where my laptop fell off. It just fell on the floor. And another time I started a Zoom call and my battery was dead. Just like I, I'm a woman, a woman in technology and having these real 
bag um, technical issues, like many yes. one call. It happens to all of us. <laughs> and I'm learning some more than others. Thank you. So we started this session with a really cool um, video that showed some of the, the work that Walgreens did. Suzette, will you share a little bit about the programs and the partnerships that were generated during this time to provide the employees and customers and communities the things that were most needed? Yeah, so I think, you know, Amy was talking about how we were able to bring things to life much faster than uh, we typically, <clears throat> excuse me, would. There's a lot of examples of that. And I think a good part of that is we did have that framework already built that we needed, that we could add upon. So certainly the testing sites were an enormous lift and really very quickly, we got to a place where we had testing sites uh, all over the country, actually, and, and doing you know thousands of tests a day. So that was a huge effort across Walgreens, um, the health services, the government, you know, all kinds of folks, some of our um, hospital partners and medical partners, you know, coming together and, and figuring out a way to do that. And then as different tests became available, such as the, you know, the one day test from Abbott, we were able to fold that in. So um, that has been a really amazing uh, capability that we've developed. And you can go on your um, Walgreens, Walgreens app and fill out your little form and get tested. Um, if you would like, feel free. Um, they are free, so the tests are free, so go ahead and do that if you're concerned. So that, that is certainly one example of a lot of different organizations coming together. But we also have other areas. Fine Care Now is an application on, again, our mobile app that allows you to connect with doctors for a variety of different issues. Um, you can do a video consultation with a doctor, which was obviously super great during this period of time when you don't really wanna go out to the doctor's office for sure. Um, I, I had uh, one of the folks on my team said, yeah, I like called at 11 o'clock at night. I wanted to know, you know, here's what I have going on. And they prescribed me something and I went to the store and got it and I was done. So that uh, we've really increased the number of partnerships that we've had on Fine Care Now very quickly, again, to be able to support folks all across the nation. We, in a matter of five weeks, developed a pharmacist video chat. So also from your mobile app, you can, uh, anytime you want, go online and, and have a video consultation with a pharmacist. And then some of the things that we're doing going forward is really how do we prepare for the immunization volume that we expect to come, both on you know, flu shots and other types of immunizations even before, uh, hopefully we'll have a COVID uh, immunization at some point, but you know, we expect to see uh, increased volume there and how can we make that a smoother process for folks to be able to kind of get in and get out without a lot of physical contact. So we've been looking at that process and, and how do we put more of that process digital so that we have less interaction with our patients. So it's been a lot of amazing capabilities that we've brought to bear. I would agree. Kristen, would you add any others? Yes. So uh, just as well as healthcare, I think the need for consumers to be able to get things from a front of store perspective, you think about the importance of sheltering in place. Everyone was really nervous because we didn't know exactly what, what COVID-19 meant and trying to protect yourself. And there was so much information coming out. So we actually expanded a couple of partnerships. We had been working with Postmates for several months in larger cities, New York, Chicago, LA. And we were very quickly able to expand with them. So basically, if you are in a city where Postmates is available and there's a Walgreens nearby, you can order um, select items from them to be delivered 
uh, at home through Postmates. It's been extremely popular and something that customers are absolutely taking advantage of. Uh, again, to just, you need a couple of things, but you don't want to take the risk of going to the store or you can't leave your child. We've all talked about, you know, even just the different ways of working that your, your kids are home now and you can't leave them at home. Uh, so, <laughs> so you, and you don't want to take them with you. So, um, so Postmates has been a very successful partnership. We've also expanded our relationship with DoorDash. Uh, and I think that that will continue to expand again, just to get those things that you need delivered to your home. We were also able to work with one of our other longstanding partners with FedEx um, to be able to temporarily offer free prescription delivery for um, patients that needed prescriptions. Again, many times these are our most vulnerable patients. They need to stay on their medication in order to remain healthy. And so to make sure that they could do that, we, we waived delivery fees um, through our partnership with FedEx and really made that a priority. And again, these are all things that, that happen very quickly. I think the thing that I was most impressed with and um, most probably involved with was the ability to pick up items, um, buy online, pick up in store, uh, curbside delivery, if you will. Um, so this literally started at the beginning of the pandemic. I think within th two weeks, we set up a very quick and dirty, that's that's my terminology, I'll use it, like, um, operational process that we uh, would let customers come through our pharmacy drive throughs and we gave them a piece of paper or we showed them a piece of paper and said, is there anything else that you need? We'll go ahead and pick that for you. Um, so it was very manual. Uh, customers really appreciated it though. They, they love the ability to pick up items in the drive through They actually didn't mind the kind of delay in service or maybe having to drive around because they had so many items that we couldn't pick it quickly. Um, and we realized that we really needed to set up something quickly for that. So again, use your mobile app. If you go into the shop portion, uh, you do have the ability for to order items to be picked up. Um, there's probably a thousand items available, our most popular items that you can order in advance. We'll have it picked and all ready for you and you can pick it up in the drive-thru. So that's pretty much chain wide. If the store has a drive-thru today, you can pick your store and do that. And I would say, again, we set this up in literally four to five weeks. It was incredible. Just the partnership between the digital teams, the business team from the, you know, the merchandising side and my team to be able to set up the process. And we're currently working on an option to be able to pick up curbside so that you can prepay for your order. You can tell us if you want to pick it up at the drive through or if you've got like 10 packs of toilet paper that we can't shove through that drive through door, <laughs> we can we can send it to you at curbside and that's going very well too. So again, just that ingenuity and the thing reinforcing the thing that everyone really said is we've um, really made a lot of progress and just moving very quickly and thinking very quickly about the consumer. It's not perfect. So, um, you know, just with anything else you learn and you go and, but it's certainly better than minimum viable product in my estimation. And so, um, and I think it's helping us accelerate some of the other things that we, we want to do. Uh, so I think you'll see more to come uh, when it comes to buy online and, and pick up in store. So lot, lots of things happening again, just within partnerships and being able to deliver what customers want and what they really need during this time. Kristen, that was a great nod to you know the digital team and the technology behind the work um, that's been done. And this is a Women in Technology International event. So I think it's very good to spend a little time with that technology lens. So I'd love to have now Amy and Suzette uh, talk about the technology lens of how all this work has come together. Sure, uh, I can kick this one off um, talking about the technology on the inventory management side. Um, so we have several systems that enable our inventory to flow end to end um, and it all starts with the forecast. So we have a really sophisticated forecasting tool that generates a store item level forecast for you know, our 9,000 stores across tens of thousands of items all using you know, a predictive science. Um, and as sophisticated as it is, it did not predict COVID, um, nor did it really know how to respond to those drastic sales changes. Um, so you know, as an inventory management team, we dug into lots of data. Um, so we used information from different sources, different teams, um, you know, sales, market level trends, insights from um, you know, the suppliers, other internal teams, news sources, 
Um, and we use that to create millions of forecast adjustments. Um, and then in addition to those forecast changes, we have a lot of other um, you know, replenishment parameters that we set to drive inventory. Um, some of those are driven off of the forecast. So you know, with the forecast changes that we were making, um, we also had to tweak some of those replenishment parameters to make sure that those were working you know, in harmony together. Um, and then outside of that, all of the other replenishment parameters that would drive inventory into our stores and our DCs, our distribution centers. Um, so making sure that we have the right level of safety stock, um, kind of going back to what Kristen was saying about, you know, the drive through, making sure that for those items in particular, you know, as we started to roll those out and implement new items that um, customers could get through the drive through, making sure that we increase safety stock on those, not exactly knowing, um, you know, which stores we're going to sell which items. Um, and so um, in addition to that, I, you know, we had different challenges that impacted um, actions differently. Um, so we had some stores that saw the dramatic sales increases uh, with pantry loading, uh, but then we also had stores that saw dramatic sales declines if you think about stores in tourist areas. Um, so you know, we had stores reacting differently. We also had items um, reacting really differently. So, um, consumers were favoring, you know, more um, stock up and, um, you know, multi-pack over, um, you know, a lot of our um, instant consumption or single pack type of product. So making sure that we were reacting to those shifts on the store item level, um, we really had to use the data and technology to guide those changes. Is that yeah, so I would say, you know, from my perspective, from a technology perspective, we have call centers, as one could imagine. And obviously in call centers, people are pretty close together as they are answering those phones. And so we needed to send about 5,000 customer service agents home and have them be able to accept calls from home. And so you know, that obviously is a big shift in workforce uh, in addition to, you know, the standard teams that people think about, oh, I need to be able to, you know, be on a meeting. I need to actually be able to take, you know, 100 calls a day from, you know, various customers throughout the United States. So we were able to, you know, we had, again, that base framework for us to be able to do work from home and really needed to increase the capacity pretty substantially uh, in a very short period of time. So, you know, being able to add uh, VDI a, as an example capacity, um, network capacity. So that's, you know, an example of where the increase in volume um, as well, you know, caused some challenges from a capacity perspective, whether it be, you know, increase in store visits or increase in calls to the call center, um, increase in employees at home, on video conference, on Teams, uh, all of those take capacity from a technology perspective. And so really being able to, without predicting, of course, the capacity need, we had to be able to react very quickly to increase our capacity in a number of ways from a technology perspective. So that was another area that you know we had to work on. And you did it extraordinarily well. We have a question in the chat. Uh, can you speak to the challenges of differing social distancing rules from state to state in some cases, differing rules specific to cities, et cetera? Kristen, that might be one that, that you is, can help us handle. Absolutely. Um, so fortunately, we have a fairly decent process for the way that state rules work. So Suzette and I work very closely. If pharmacy boards have different regulations, how do we adapt our systems? But Really what we did for COVID is our government relations team um, works very closely and they were responsible for making sure that they're reading all of these ordinances and amendments and executive orders. And you're absolutely right. It was cities and counties and states and sometimes the county didn't match the state um, and the city. So um, typically what we do is they're responsible for advising us what what we need to account for. Most of the things were related to occupancy, how many people we allow in store, whether or not face masks are required. Um, though if we, some states though, when as specific as you can't sell Hallmark cards because 
it's not an essential service. So we have a core team that every time something comes together, we actually, it was becoming so frequent that we set up kind of a teams and like, this is the team that you're gonna contact and then we're gonna go out and operationalize what we need to do. If that's putting caution tape over the Hallmark cards or hanging a sign for occupancy, Fortunately, our buildings are large enough that for the most part, we didn't have to actually have someone measure occupancy unless if it was required by the ordinance. Um, and face mask, again, we, we put signs up. We did make the decision as a company, which I think many other retailers are doing as well, um, that we're going to strongly suggest that our customers wear a mask. We wanna strongly suggest that they follow whatever ordinance, um, but enforcing that becomes a bit of a challenge for us. Um, and mainly that's around team member safety. So I'm sure many of you have heard stories where we've tried, you know, fortunately we have not had any, I'll knock on wood there, um, but um, customers, uh, team members from other retailers have tried to enforce this and it's become a very dangerous situation for them. Um, but essentially it's, it's just like any sort of other um, disaster recovery. You have a team that's responsible for taking all that in. We make quick decisions on the things that we need to do and we really leverage our government relations also if we think that something within the order isn't fair or something that we need to think of differently. But it was all over the board and there were requests coming in multiple times a day, it seemed like, from all of the di different changes. Thank you, Kristen. Mm -hmm. Anything that anybody else on the panel would like to add to that? I, I was just going to add um, similar to, you know, sort of what I was talking about with the sales changes. We had the, you know, if you can imagine as all of the different, you know, states, county, cities are opening differently, we'll see quick shifts in consumer buying behavior. So um, very similar, um, you know, to what we, you know, did the whole time was just monitor sales trends very closely. We had to get down to the store item level and make a lot of forecast adjustments um, and parameter changes to make sure that we had enough product to support those sales. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll also note that Anne put a compliment in the chat there noting that Walgreens nimble response is um, admirable. So thank you, Anne, for that, that compliment. And, and it really is to the credit of the great leaders you, you see here and the folks who are behind them on their teams. So much appreciated. So let's just kind of chat now about just, you know, some fun stuff and some funny stuff that has happened during these, um, my little incident notwithstanding. Um, who can share some like funny tips or you know funny stories of things of ways of working, et cetera? I heard Kristen that you had one. What would you share? Yeah, so I think we're all sort of learning. Um, we talked a little bit about you know maybe we're wearing yoga pants uh, underneath the table today. You don't really know what we're wearing underneath, but I think the hardest thing about getting used to teams um, with my peers in some meetings is they were still on the conference call, not muted while they're in the restroom. And it becomes a very awkward situation to like, do you say something? You know, you kind of generally say, hey, everyone needs to mute, but if they don't get the message, like, do you call them out and say, hey, Joe, I think you really should mute yourself. Um, so we had a couple of those instances. Fortunately, um, it, it wasn't me, but I'm all, also now very obsessed that regardless of the situation, I'm kind of checking my mute. And most of the time, Brian uh, and Suzette will attest, uh, I'm talking and nothing's coming out of my mouth because I just try so hard to keep myself on mute as much as I can. <laughs> yeah. Better better mute than sorry. Absolutely, <laughs> <all> absolutely. <laughs> uh, who else would add something? Yeah, from a, from a tip standpoint, you know, a, a couple of things I'll say and then a, a funny story related. You know, I, I think, you know, from IT, we're pretty used to working remote and, and dealing, but the, the difference here is just the, the amount of time you go without seeing people, you know, in, in person, because it you'd be remote, but it'd be every other day type of thing or a few times a week, right? So I, from a tip perspective, I think it's really important to make sure you're, you're turning camera on, doing video conference, just because it, it really does help build that interaction, helps people stay engaged. Um, the other thing I'd say, just with so many calls, it gets very monotonous, right? Just call after call. So anything you could do to try to build morale, have fun, some were mentioned, I think Suzette mentioned what some of her teams are doing, um, of just trying to, to break it up, do some fun activities. And, and a funny example is we have a daily stand-up call 
we were doing for COVID 7 a.m. And, and the person, uh, and it was going on probably 15 minutes and the person leading it, someone uh, someone else virtually kind of raised their hand and said, hey, Josh, are you, are you a talking potato? And sure enough, for 15 minutes, he had been on the screen with a filter being a talking potato. And it's just a good example of things that could be done to, to kind of really break up and, and build that team morale or camaraderie even with the, the time because you're not spending time face to face. Well said. Anything else that anybody wants to add here? I'm just kind of leaving it open mic style here if there's anything All right, else. I'll jump in. Um, I, I really do want to applaud Walgreens uh, nimble adaption of the, pro of the protocols that you put in place and are not the first time I'm aware of your corporation being so ahead of the curve. Um, I attended a uh, Opportunity Green Conference where uh, Wal uh, someone from Walgreens was the keynote speaker talking about how um, skylights were installed in all the Walmarts and that there were sensors that triggered the um, powering or the using of um, solar energy from the, from the solar panels on the roof to augment the lighting when the sun went behind a cloud and that it was all controlled from one room, like the environments of all the Walmart. So you guys rock. Thank you. So we are nearing the end of our time here. I would like to allow all of our panelists to just kind of reflect on how things have changed for you personally and professionally. And as you look across the entire landscape, what do you think are the changes that, you know, are here uh, and which ones, you know, were kind of a flash in the, in the pan. So kind of an open mic for each of you to um, just kind of share what you share with the audience. And let's go in the order of Kristen, Amy, then Brian, the opposite of how we started. Go ahead. Okay, um, so I, I think that for me, uh, I've learned a ton about myself just in how you can think about things differently, move to speed very quickly and not have to have things under perfection. Some of that is just a part of working for Walgreens for 24 years and being in operations and I wanted something delivered to me that was really well done. Um, but I, I think that our customers and our team members have a lot more um, patience for things, just knowing that we need to move faster. So that's personally also reflected upon me not to get so uptight about delivering perfection. Um, and I think one of the ways that uh, one of the things that are around to stay is really this virtual working, being more open to that. Even my husband and I have been talking about I, I typically came into the office every day just because I liked being face to face, but I'm, I'm finding that uh, I don't think that I'll be doing that every day unless if there's just something really important happening. Um, it's okay to be virtual. You can still connect with your team in a really powerful way. I would concur on the, you know, I think it will change going forward how people work from home and I would speculate that we're going to have a lot of empty office buildings uh, in the future years and, and have to find really an innovative way to utilize that office space because I think that people will spend much more time working from home because I, similar to Kristen, used to go in every day, love to be with people. I'm definitely one of those walk around managers and um, I have found I can absolutely do my job every day from home and I love my dogs and my kids and my husband. So it's like, why not stay here? So uh, I think that will definitely be something um, that will, will stay. From a more personal perspective, I would say I'm really interested to see what happens in education. I think that there is a lot of opportunity for us to improve education quality um, using online and in-person mix of education in a very powerful way. And so I'm hopeful. I know a lot of people did not have the best experience with online education because I think it wasn't fully strategically thought through. 
But I, I do think there's a huge opportunity for really improving the way we educate our kids in this country. And so I'm looking forward to seeing what happens there. Amy? Well, I echo both of those. Um, I, I definitely, similar to Kristen, I think, you know, the um, grew a lot professionally with um, the need for speed. Um, I think that really, um, you know, pushed me to um, learn and grow uh, more quickly than I ever have. Um, my manager actually left the company, um, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic. So that also sort of, um, you know, created the opportunity for me to, um, you know, assume higher level work and, um, you know, really make an impact at a time when it was critical to the business. So, um, on the, on the personal side, I think, um, you know, I, I also, I think there's going to be a lot more, um, you know, remote work. I know our routine has changed a lot and probably like everyone, you know, some, uh, some for the good, some for the bad. Um, I think, you know, we've really enjoyed not rushing out the door in the morning, um, still being able to feel connected at work. Um, but then we also miss some of our, you know, normalcy, daily routine, um, and socialization. So um, my son's been out of school um, and home from camp this summer. And, you know, I can tell he's missing out on some of the socialization. Um, but also we're enjoying a, a little bit slower pace of life um, and talking a lot about health and safety. And I think that's something that will sort of remain as part of our new normal. Thank you. Yeah, from, from my perspective, I think um, personally, one of the things I've noticed is just the way I, my shopping and consumer habits have, have changed. I, interesting, right? I always bought a lot online, but definitely now stores close everything. Doing, you know, I never would have done grocery shopping. I'm doing curbside pickup, you know, Instacart, many things like even picking up orders to go, you know, using all those, the, the you know, Grubhub and the other things, right? So I think that's different what, whether I will fully stick with that when I, you know, after COVID, I think some, some will, other ones grocery store, I can't wait to have that more. It's not my favorite thing to do. Um, so I think interesting to that of, you know, I definitely see consumer behaviors of both myself and many others will be interesting how that, how that changes. Um, personally, I think a lot of, a lot of what people have said of just the, the, the time being with the, you know, away from the office has been definitely good from a, a slower pace, been very nice to, to be home. I, I personally, don't see myself working 100% at home after just because I do like the camaraderie of going into the office. But on the other hand, there are, are lots of like, like the group has set positives and, and negatives towards it. So um, it will be interesting that after, after COVID, but I, I would see myself still going in quite a bit. Thank you all for those really great answers to all of the questions and for sharing your expertise. I echo uh, Cherry's point uh, in the, the notes about uh, just how grateful I am for you sharing your subject matter expertise. Also, a very special thank you to Pearl Patel, who was also co-moderator. Thank you very much. She was also the uh, most amazing behind the scenes talent in pulling all of this together. Um, so let's say a huge thank you to her for all of her work. Um, we are about to end the session, but there is a video that we would love to share that shows how we're really thinking about the whole person and the whole family. And I hope it gives you an idea of maybe how to use some family members if you have them. Go ahead, Pearl, and roll the final video. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. 
you like to purchase any other items today? Yep. What would you like to purchase? Um, some donuts, hot wheels, soap, and wipes. Thank you. I'm safe and healthy. Yeah. Bye bye. Since 1901, be safe and healthy. Bye, all.